Hi, welcome to Audiobook Academy. This is a self-paced audiobook. There's no need to keep an eye on things. Just pay attention. Thank you for taking the time to listen. As a starting point, consider the following. How do you think we should assess where we are now? In terms of someone's ability to persuade others to like them, how can I know if I'm a natural at persuasion? Or mediocre at persuasion, or somewhere in the middle? Because I believe that in real life, we are all the same. Regardless of how incredible you are, people are going to say no at times. So, what did you make of it? For example, does a particular person have a lot of space? Whether you want to improve, or if you don't want to improve, as well as one of the telltale signs. There's a lot of opportunity for development here. This is something I've been teaching for over 15 years. I wrote a book about it, and I'm still learning new things. Maybe I still get someone to point things out to me now and then. Oh, that's a wonderful point, I think. That was something I didn't notice. So I believe that if I can immerse myself in it like way, I will be successful. And I'm still saying I'm improving and growing all the time people who haven't immersed themselves, on the other hand. They have much more room to expand. Certainly. That is one principle, as well. Let's take a step back and look at things from a different perspective. So, in your work, you unpack a lot of things. And one of your novels that has had an impact on others, everyday opportunities to persuade their final skeptic to become moral so, how would you organize or disseminate this information? As we delve more into this, what is the key message? As for the subtitle, as you mentioned, persuasion chances abound on a daily basis. That are both long-term and ethical, that's incredibly important to understand what I'm talking about. Because I always tell them how strong it is since it is based on research this isn't someone's wise counsel, this is supported by empirical evidence. It's a talent that you can use on a daily basis. I mean, most people are aware of it. If they wish to be successful at work, they must do the following. They need to persuade people to accept their proposal. However, when they return home, life has become more tranquil and enjoyable. When they can persuade those closest to them to say yes. As a result, it's a useful skill. The true opportunities are the following, returning to the question you posed at the outset, do you think there's space for improvement? The majority of individuals are oblivious to the language of influence. And until you're able to put a label on something, you normally don't notice it until it becomes a regular occurrence. However, if you've mastered the language and are able to label objects, you'd be surprised how often you get it right. Way the salesperson is attempting to persuade you to purchase, marketers attempting to get you to go to the store, politicians are attempting to persuade you to vote for them. As a result, you begin to recognize these possibilities. Then there's the matter of persuasion. The majority of folks have no idea what that is. What is your definition of persuasion? If I ask you, the most common request I get is to persuade someone. Pete, it sounds like you're trying to change someone's mind. Unless, of course, you ask this follow-up question. If you tell your child to clean his or her room, do you want them to say, that's a good idea, mum or dad, or something similar? Or B, go into their room and clean it. And everyone understands it. They wish for them to alter their behavior. And when I speak of persuasion, I mean. It's all about changing one's habits. Persuading someone to do something they wouldn't normally do if you hadn't inquired. So it all boils down to the question. And if we do it properly, we'll be rewarded. It has the potential to have a long-term impact on people. And, of course, we want to do it in an ethical manner. When it comes to ethics, though, why don't we go for it right now? If the listener expresses any reluctance. So, ethics, I mean, I believe we all enjoy them. Can you share some golden guidelines with us? That you should keep in mind when employing influence and ethical persuasion? Sure. The first is beneficial to both me and you. I'm sorry, but I can't ask you to do something. That isn't in your best interests, either. 
otherwise, I'm only interested in myself. I believe everybody who is listening to this will agree with me. If they said that person is only looking out for himself, I'd believe them. They are not interested in doing business with them. So whatever I propose needs to be beneficial to you. It needs to be beneficial to me. A win-win situation, to use Stephen Covey's phrase. Second, hum, we must be truthful. Not only are we sincere in what we say, but we are also sincere in what we do. But also in being open and honest about what we know. Because simply looking you in the eyes isn't enough. And respond, well, Pete, I think I've covered all of your bases. And you gave me a look and replied, Brian, yes. However, you failed to inform me when you sold me the house. The foundation had a break in it. Yeah Pete, I'm saying, it wouldn't do to say you didn't ask that question. You might say, hey, if I'd only known I would have chosen a different path. As a result, we're forthright. About what it is that we are discussing what it is that we have to offer. We are, nonetheless, confident. Because even if there is a flaw in anything, if we are truthful and bring it up very early deal with it in the dialogue as a trustworthy person, we earn reputation. Then we'll go on to some of the advantages. A description of our goods or service. As a result, we generate win-win situations. We are truthful. Then there's the third topic that we discuss. Is that these psychological principles are the only ones we employ. That are appropriate to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Anyone, I believe, is a good illustration of this. Who is listening who is a homeowner? Most likely, they've had individuals try to sell them roofing. Whether it's gutters, siding, or painting, key things that we all require in our houses and they've undoubtedly heard something like this Pete is a guy who likes to you can save 15% if you sign up today. But, if I have to return at a later time, I'm afraid I won't be able to offer you the same deal. They are attempting to elicit a feeling of shortage. Oh, I'm going to lose this if I don't act right now. He or she is proposing a fantastic deal. And most of the time, it's nonsense. Because whatever it is that they have to offer is most likely in plentiful supply. They are merely doing it to play with your emotions. Compel you to make a decision right now. So they don't have to return or you don't have to reconsider so that isn't being sincere. In terms of how a principle is applied although there is no scarcity, they are attempting to squeeze it. In order to alter their behavior that makes sense, right? That's something I like. That's a wonderful artwork in terms of how natural it appears. It also makes logic. What can you achieve if you sink your teeth into it? And study this material. Well, Pete, there are a number of things we do. Every every day, even if it may not appear to be significant, they are, however, vital. To advance the ball in our work and I'll give you an illustration. In my previous professional life, a component of my accountability was tasked with assisting in the recruitment of insurance agents go visit the company where I worked when we found out about the, that isn't always simple. Selling insurance does not appear to be a fun job. For a large number of people to whom you may be reaching out. I haven't met anyone yet. I want to be an insurance agent, he stated as he grew up. Everyone has a tale about how they ended up in the insurance industry. However, it is a fantastic industry. And if you're a good insurance agent, you can make a lot of money. It has the potential to be extremely profitable. As a result, they are frequently on the lookout for good companies to represent. And one of our responsibilities was to assist with their recruitment. When we learnt about the principle of scarcity, we were enthralled. Which serves as a reminder that people want more of what they can do without, that we place a higher value on things when we believe they are uncommon or deteriorating in some way we had been prospecting these agents, after all. For quite some time he had never considered incorporating this principle. So, Pete, here's what we did. We've always had a small team of agents. Something we'd bring on at any time of year let's imagine the number was 50. 
and we never thought to make a big deal out of it. When you're only in 30 states, 50 isn't much. As a result, by the third quarter's end, we sent out a postcard or an email message to potential agents. Pete, part of the reason, the last paragraph would say, I'm contacting you right now is to inform you that we are only looking to hire 50 agents. In each of our 30 operational states we've appointed 40 people as of today. We hope you'll be one of the last few people we appoint. At the end of the year, we received a response as soon as we submitted the email. My boss came over to me within an hour. I can't believe that, he said. Eight agents have already contacted me via phone or email. As a result of such communication, I've never had someone answer within an hour, he said. And we were aware of the only difference. Was the last paragraph, informing them of the situation by the end of the year, there would be very few spots left. Those agents who are thinking about it, it shifted the needle all of a sudden. That was a significant victory for us. In the grand scheme of things, it isn't particularly significant. However, for the sake of what we were doing, it was critical to our objectives. That's exciting, to say the least. When you can link a modification to a certain outcome as a result, that's leverage. That's thrilling, and it's strong. And I suppose it's understandable. If some people were considering, what's more, guess what? Perhaps I'm considering a career or industry change. Go to a different firm. In contrast to, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh I'd best get started on this right immediately. Or else I'm afraid this opportunity will be lost to me. Exactly, and we're all affected by it. I've heard folks say things like, that material doesn't seem to work on me. But we've all been there. On Sunday, this is where we got off the couch. We also went to the store because we had heard that the sale would finish on Sunday. Maybe we arrived on Friday. Since, according to what we've heard, supply are limited. And the truth is, we probably wouldn't have gone anyhow. If I hadn't been warned, I would have gone to the store to the fact that something would be restricted I believe there is a lot of online sales material. With the help of a funnel, a launch, and a deadline, it doesn't feel nice, either. I suppose I've done that as well. Despite the fact that there was a valid explanation with respect to the deadline. It's as though, hey, everyone is getting started. At this point in time, the class. To have a community, we need to reach a critical mass. There will also be some live sessions. And you'd be missing them if you didn't sign up before the deadline, you won't be able to participate. So that was the truth, however, there are a lot of other situations when this isn't the case. When a digital training course is available, it's available for 24 or 72 hours, I'm not sure. I'm just curious as to why. It appears to be the only explanation. That deadline is there to force me to complete this task right now. I'm not fond of it. At the same time, I suppose it may be a win-win situation. It's as if I already know what you need to do. In order to get off your ass and make something happen, you must first get off your ass. I need a little amount of pressure in this situation. On the other hand, it's not so pleasant to be on the receiving end. I'd want to hear your thoughts on this. That, I believe, is a good illustration. Because there is almost certainly nothing in limited supply since it is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. It's not like they were running out on supplies. Alternatively, your example of teaching a class, early registrants, you could say, will pay this premium. It goes up if you register by a specific date. And by this day, it's even higher. Well, a seat is a seat, someone may respond. Is that reasonable? Yes, I believe it's because you have to plan ahead of time. You have to transport materials, you need to book a room with certain seats. As a result, you may incur additional fees. Yes, I definitely believe that. As a result, 
you're passing it on. It simplifies your life. As a result, you'll make their lives easier. By imposing such a deadline. I believe that deadlines are necessary. When you're aware that those deadlines will also benefit others so there was this Dan Orally material that I read. They were looking at students who were either not given a deadline or were given one that was too short. You have six papers due at the conclusion of the semester, all of which are due on the same day. You're an adult, therefore you can do them whenever you want. A group had the option of setting their own deadlines. There was also a group of people who were set deadlines. Contrary to popular belief, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Those that were given deadlines performed the best. Because we're all, I mean, almost everyone who's listening there were instances when they were late because of this. Despite all of their research and cramming, they had a lot of time on their hands. And it's such a common human trait to do so. As a result, I believe that establishing deadlines there is a good idea. You can remark, yeah, you could have had it. Till the semester's end, however, most pupils will benefit from it. If we set these deadlines and stick to them, we will be successful. Can you tell me about some of the other options? Once you see, most significant principles that you expressed, something should be labelled. It's something you can use and recognise. Is it possible to hear some more useful labels? Okay. So one of the ideas that we discuss is the principle of liking is what it's called, and it informs us that that we prefer to say yes to folks we are familiar with furthermore, as some listeners may be saying right now, we all know that, right? But there's something that a lot of folks overlook, is figuring out how to make that a reality. And the majority of people will find themselves in difficult situations. They put up a lot of effort to make people like them. That's preferable to doing nothing. However, going is the most powerful thing you can do. In a position to say I'm not sure how I'm going to like this other individual. As a result, I'm going to connect. On the things that we share in common I'm going to pay attention. I'll do my best to get it in. I also get excited when I hear something we have in common, such as we either grew up in the same place or support the same sports team. That's what I'm going to start talking about. I want to get along with the people I'm networking with. I'm either going to work with assistants and such, or I'm going to look for something else. I'm looking for things I can commend them on. Since I am aware of if I find those items, I'll begin to value them more. And here's why it's so important, when the other person thinks you genuinely care about them and you're starting to like them at LOT. It allows individuals to open out since we all have deep-seated beliefs. That friends look out for one another. The good news is that we treat our friends with respect. You'll never want to leave a buddy if you're actually a friend. Use your friends to your advantage and it's a great approach to get rid of the whole thing. About the game of manipulation because when I consider the folks I know and admire, I want to assist them, and they are aware of my desire to assist them. It also generates a wonderful virtuous loop. So I believe it is a very significant principle. However, the trick is to avoid attempting to persuade others to like you. Make an effort to like other individuals. Yes, that's fantastic. Then there's the research, which is a part of it. And concentrating on commonality how else are we supposed to like them? There are things like, I mean. When you're with someone, if you mirror and match, and you are aware of their body language you fall into a rhythm. When you make a conscious decision to speak at a slower tempo, not to manipulate them in any way, along the lines of theirs but to say, I'd like to make this person feel at ease around me, I want to feel at ease around them. Because the more we regard ourselves as being alike, the more similar we become. What we chat about, what we have in common, and so on all of these things start to build a rapport. Hey, that individual reminds me of myself, for example. As a result, I find them appealing. It's a lot easier to like folks who share your interests. In numerous ways, and then, of course, there's the fact that I mentioned paying honest compliments to someone another topic that we discuss from time to time is when you collaborate in a cooperative manner when you're successful, you're prone to high-fiving. 
and truly see each other in a more favorable light. So, especially for those who are in positions of leadership, who are you listening to? If you have staff who may or may not get along, that's fantastic. Place them in circumstances where they must collaborate. Do not place children in settings where they will be exposed to danger. That will be difficult to achieve success in. You want them to take small steps at first. However, they are successful because they work together. People naturally turn their gaze to the other individual. That was fantastic, you did an excellent job, they exclaim. They then begin to compliment each other. So those are some natural techniques to get others to like you. One of the most intriguing principles is the notion of constancy is very important for salespeople. People frequently inquire, what is the most potent influence principle? And, as I usually say, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Because it is dependent on the situation. These principles aren't always available, however. Or at the very least, none of them are always available. If you're a salesperson, however, the importance of consistency cannot be overstated. Because of the consistency principle is built on the foundation of asking smart questions. And here's how we define the principle. We are under psychological duress on the inside. However, there is also external social pressure. To be constant in our words and actions so, to hammer this point home, Pete, have you ever made a promise to someone? You'd be with a friend, a family member, or someone else. Or did you intend to do anything with them but had to cancel? Happened. I'm attempting to remember a certain incident. However, I agree with you. Okay. When I ask a question to a group of people, almost everyone may recall a period when, we completely forgot about our children's recital. Someone got sick, and I have to remain home, for example. When someone says, I'm sure there are legitimate reasons, I believe them. I'm sorry, but I won't be able to attend. This is why. Don't worry about it, advises a pal. But how do we feel in reality? When I ask them that question, the majority of them say, I was devastated to have to inform them that I would be unable to attend. I felt awful or remorseful. So, what are we going to do? We don't want to experience those emotions. We put in a lot of effort to keep our promises. And after you've grasped it. Instead than telling individuals what to do. You begin to inquire. Because when you ask and they agree to help you, it's a win-win situation. It elicits an interior feeling of. I want to be consistent in my words and actions. Because I will, first and foremost, feel better about myself. Oh, and I'll look better in your eyes, too. As a result, it's a strong motivator of human activity. Certainly, and as a result when you're trying to persuade and influence others knowing that we are surrounded by a great force, what are some of the most common ways something might be lost? Okay. As a result, it's highly frequent in a corporate atmosphere. To inform someone of their requirements I might pass you by and say, I need the sales figures by Friday, Pete. Now, you might get them to me, or you might not. But I know this because of my studies. If I say, I'll be more effective if I say, I'll be more effective. Would you be able to help, Pete? Gonna provide me with sales figures by Friday. Because if you say yes, you're saying yes to everything. You have a far better chance of succeeding. If you don't say anything, it's better than if you don't say anything at all. However, a more intelligent approach would be to, would you be able to help, Pete? Gonna provide me with sales figures by Tuesday. Now, if you say you can't, I'll believe you. Then there are my backup plans. I'd like to say, Pete, I understand how hectic things are around here. Is there any way you could get these to me? Wednesday at the end of the day. This is utilizing a different principle. That is what we refer to as reciprocity. 
and people will notice if you come in with a new request right away. When someone says no, there is a lot of evidence that supports this. People will be more likely to accept your invitation. As a result, by beginning to consider what you require, you will be able to achieve your goals. I'm not sure how to ask, or how to put up fallback positions. So that if that individual answers, no, I'm too busy, you can say, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. Oh, I'll just wait until Wednesday. I'll be able to postpone till Thursday. Even Friday is still an option. As a result, the manager who develops the habit of asking rather than telling, and putting themselves in a position to fall back on will be able to receive what they require significantly more frequently than someone who simply tells folks what they want to hear before the deadline well, I'm also curious, and I suppose this is a bit hazardous, if you were to say, however, if you were to say, however, if when do you think you'll be able to finish this? Then they create their own deadline. Is there a way to make that even more powerful? Because it came from them in terms of like. Yes. When someone creates their own reasons, aims, and objectives, this is known as self-generation. They'll be more dedicated to them. You may stare at me and say, Brian is a master of persuasion. And if I tell you what you should probably do, you'll probably do it. You give it some credence because you're thinking, Brian, after all, knows what he's doing. He published a book. But if I ask you the appropriate questions, you'll tell me. And you come up with the identical concept, you own it. Because you think it's a good idea. And we're all quite certain in our ideas. As a result, that becomes a new skill. Which is based on this premise, however, by asking the appropriate questions to get individuals to come up with their own solutions, it's an essential component of the coaching process. Because coaching is all about imparting knowledge to others. To be able to think independently when they start coming up with their own ideas, it's even better. They gain confidence as a result. At coming up with their own ideas in the future, they don't require as much coaching as others, and they don't require as much care. We are supposed to defer to people, according to authority. That we regard as wiser or more knowledgeable when we're trying to make a decision if we're standing about at a cocktail party, for example. We're all whining about taxes, after all. Well, I'm a CPA, someone replies afterwards. We give that greater weight if they start talking. We know that individual understands a lot more about taxes than we do. Than we most likely do. This is a funny anecdote from a few years back. My wife is an incredibly talented golfer. And when I say very good, I mean it. She is handicapped by a single digit. She frequently shoots in the upper 70s, indicating that she is really talented. I just got back from a sales training program, and... I also informed her about a golf analogy I had used previously. Throughout the training. She's reading a book a few weeks later when she says, pay attention to what Corey Pavan has to say. For those of you who are paying attention. In the early 1990s, Corey Pavan won the US Open. He also placed in the top five. In all of the major golf tournaments Pete, she reads this paragraph. It's practically word for word what I said. So, of course, I had to inform her. I told you that. Jane, I said. No, you didn't, she stated emphatically. I stated, yes, it was a few weeks ago. Do you recall how I returned home following the training event? No. I'm off, please, don't make me laugh. We were having dinner right here, after all. You don't have any. She had no recollection of me telling her that. So, finally, I raised my hands and said, Oh, well, if Corey Pavan says it, it must be true, right? But it's not true when I say it. But here's the truth. Because he was a professional golfer who won the US Open. Corey Pavan or Brian Aham, the trainer, who do you believe? It's a hilarious story, but it makes a powerful message. 
It is possible for two persons to say the same thing. The individual who is regarded as an authority figure. Far more than the individual. Who has zero credibility in that field despite this, it can be equally true. The statement made by both individuals as a result, it's really significant. That people will go to any length to obtain their expertise in the presence of others and now I'm really curious. Do we believe that this is the case? For the enigmatic occurrence in a meeting, when someone says something and no one responds, and yet another person expresses similar sentiments, yes, yes, they all respond. And there's a lot of stuff behind there. Do we believe that authority is the primary motivator? Or are there any other components? That might explain why things are the way they are. There's a chance there will be some chemistry. Oh yeah, you know, we love Joe, people would say. Everyone enjoys it when Joe says something. However, it is more likely that it is based on authority. When I was reporting in my corporate position, to the vice president of sales at one time, there were occasions when he'd approach me and say, I'd like you to write this for me. After that, send it to these individuals. And, I'd add, I'll write it for you. However, I would appreciate it if you could email it to me. Because, coming from a sales vice president, it will have far greater significance than if it came from me. And he was well versed on the subject. You're correct, he says. As a result, I felt good about knowing. I was the one who sent the message. I was honing my skills in order to assist me in writing the book. I could go on and on, but I was modest enough to say, the goal is to get the ball moving ahead. To move the company's objectives forward and I'm saying exactly the same thing. I can't help you as much as you can, so I'll spare you some time. Construct the message and by working together, we'll be able to make this happen. Yes, that is spot on. And this reminds me of something that happened just a few weeks ago. I began a new training program with a group of people. We were on the move. Through the program for enhanced thinking and collaboration as a result, there is some preliminary work to be done. And the vast majority of people had yet to do so. I mean, I have the email addresses of all the participants. They haven't met me yet, though. As a result, I recommended the same thing. It's as if, Here's a quick review of what's going on. Who has completed the pre-work and who has not. I'd like to have them prompt me, which is something I could do. However, I believe it would be a lot better if it came from you. And, indeed, she prompted. The pre-work began to pour in, and the task was completed. Yep. I believe it is simply a matter of time. Of some people having the humility to say, it's fine if the communication does not originate with me. Isn't it true that I'll have my time? If I follow the rules and assist the company, I will be successful. I'll get my praise if you drive the agenda forward. I'll be the one on the lookout for a promotion. I'm sure I'll be in that situation at some point. I'm the one who sends the messages. However, hone your message creation skills. Allow the correct person to deliver the message, nevertheless. We look to other individuals for social proof, according to social proof. To see how we should act in different scenarios what other people believe has a big influence on us. What they're up to, how they're feeling. And I always spread the message. It's important to keep in mind that there will be a lot of people here. Crowds of people, whether large and little, have an effect on how we think. How we feel and how we act are two different things. Pete, it's noteworthy to note that in the United States, owing to the fact that we live in a more individualized culture. When we talk about this, people sometimes say, oh, yeah, people retaliate, and I've overheard comments like following the crowd never yielded anything worthwhile. That is something I agree with. Medical advances, great leaders, and people are all examples of this. When people break away from the crowd, amazing things happen. However, I would issue a challenge to those who are listening, 
How many times a day do you try to achieve greatness? Also, how frequently do you just try? To help you get through the day. When you're driving home from work, it's even worse. When you notice that there is a traffic jam and people begin to escape at an exit, without consulting a map or a phone app you might decide that I should take the exit as well. Why? Everyone else is doing it. It's probably the best course of action. Greatness has nothing to do with it. I just want to get home as soon as possible. And we are faced with these decisions on a daily basis. All day long, and humans have developed to understand what that means. If other people are doing something, it's a good sign. It's probably the best course of action. A large percentage of the time I'd also like to hear your thoughts. When it comes to creating your message. When you're giving the message out, what sorts of things get up in there and to see if you can appeal to these dimensions in any way. I'd also like to hear your thoughts. About how we may just grab people's attention first and foremost and persuade them to listen to our persuasive argument. A couple of things come to mind immediately away. The first is individuality. People are drawn to one of a kind items. If I have seven red balls and one white ball, what should I do? The white ball will attract attention. That'll be the one that stands out. It's the only one of its kind. As a result, putting forth what is unique will assist you. In that case, however, here is where an understanding of psychology comes in handy. Persuasion skills come in handy. Since it isn't always about bragging rights, take a look at this one-of-a-kind item. No one else has this, it says at times. In a way, it's the same thing, but in reverse. It makes use of a loss frame. Scarcity is a component of it, but by talking about it, we can alleviate it about what someone will be missing out on. If they refuse to attend your training, read your content, purchase your product, your service, and so on, it's significantly more effective than simply stating, buy our product or service. Because of this one distinguishing trait when it's framed like this, the distinctiveness shines through. Nobody else has it, and it is far more powerful than everyone else. So that's one approach. Another strategy for grabbing people's attention dates back to the 1960s. By asking questions, you may adhere to the idea of consistency. So, Pete, here's an example. I was in a training session many years ago. After lunch, the trainer arrived. There are approximately 40 persons in this room. Hey, before we get started, he adds. Anyone have any recommendations for a decent dinner spot? Are you here in Columbus? And then people start shouting their responses. And some folks have their hands in their pockets. Waving their hands in the air, for example. He only keeps it going for a few seconds. All right, time out, he says. I frequently visit Columbus. I also know where I'll be eating dinner. To establish a point, I asked a question. People feel forced to respond when you pose a question. Notice how many people screamed out replies, he added. And, by the way, how many of you have raised your hands? For those who didn't say anything, he added. Or raise your hands if you're thinking about a certain location. They began to smile and nod in response. And he was well aware that everyone had responded to that query whether it's in their heads or out loud so the point is that if you ask a good question, you will get a good answer. It will encourage individuals to start thinking about what that solution is, and whether or not it is imaginative enough, it's possible that they'll be desperate for an explanation. To put it another way, open your email. Something, take a peek at your brochure regardless of what you're attempting to advertise. And, as you may be aware, in the book Persuasion, it contains a plethora of amusing questions about, do you consider yourself to be a helpful individual? Or do you consider yourself to be a daredevil? Yeah. So there's some self-identification going on there. They were then kind of prepped to, if you chance to have something new, please let us know. This could entice adventurers. 
If you're asking for assistance, and they've answered yes, that can line up there since I'm helpful. What makes a good question, in your opinion? Because I see it frequently, and it may be effective. Maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. But when I ask if you're searching for a way out, I mean it. That you can increase your home's tidiness without having to spend a fortune. I'm not sure. I mean, when I hear those questions, maybe they're extremely effective, but I'm just like, no, you know, I'm not like that. And it's possible that the mission has been accomplished. They've effectively omitted me. They've also pre-qualified those who aren't. But I'm not sure. What are your thoughts on the matter? Is a yes-no question like that acceptable? Or what constitutes a good question? It all depends on the situation. As a result, I believe that in marketing, asking a question is a good idea. It's extremely different in the way you just expressed it. Rather of approaching a coworker. So that you can do something. When I talk about leaders who don't tell, I'm referring to people who don't tell. And begin by inquiring about some of the components of a good interaction. To turn a statement into an inquiry with someone to have a backup plan, to use the word because research have shown that when you utilize the word, because there will be a considerable increase in the number of those who say yes. Because we've been conditioned since we were children, right? When you dare to say, mom, parents say why am I being forced to do this? It's not a valid explanation because I stated so, but, because I stated so, we began to learn once I heard. I'd better get started. As a result, rather than making a statement, ask a question, have a backup plan if you're going to use the word because, make sure it's accompanied by a reason. That's an excellent approach to do it in a business setting. To persuade others to join the team and do what they need to do, instead, provide me the sales figures by Friday. I agree with you when it comes to marketing. Some of the things that are simply so overt irritate me. That I believe the majority of people will begin to shy away. As a result of it, you know 97% of my pals are a bad example. Will you have the courage to repost this? I'm not going to do it. Because I believe that is deceptive. It's most likely a complete fabrication. In fact, it works against people. Because if 97% of the population isn't doing anything, why should I, then? It's a disaster. Right. It's a terrible approach to persuade people to act. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Please don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in next audiobook.